Uh, let us pray and then we'll hear the word together. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. And may we all, Lord, listen carefully and seek to respond to how your Spirit speaks to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we continue our series on Nehemiah. We have seen how God has moved Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem. How God has moved the people to come together in unity to build the wall. And last week, we heard about how the building of the wall had started. And despite opposition, in unity, the people held firm and they built the wall. In fact, interestingly, if you sneak a peek at next week's passage, the author then goes on to tell us how the wall is finally completed despite opposition. So a question that I want you to think about is what is going on with our passage for this week? You see, our passage today, despite being in the middle of these two narratives about the wall, mentions nothing about the wall. Our passage today seems to be out of place in the bigger narrative. You can drop Nehemiah 5 from this book. You can read chapters 3, 4, and 6 straight. And you will feel like you haven't missed anything. So why is chapter 5 here in this book? Let us think on that as we continue to look through the text. Now have a look at the first section, verse 1 to 5. Now in this verse we see that a great complaint has risen in the community. There was a great outcry of the people and their wives, but this was not an outcry against the enemies of the people like the Ammonites, the Arabs, the Ashdodites. Rather, the complaint were against their fellow Jews. And we see in verse 2, the people can barely afford food. They complain, let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. The people were starving. They were unable to feed their families. Then we go on to see in verse 3 that because of the famine that they're going through, things have become very hard. Their crops were failing, so they had to mortgage their fields, their vineyards, even their houses to survive so that they can get food. More than that, there was a tax they need to pay. They had to borrow money in order to pay the king's tax over the field and the vineyards. So already, the lands are not providing enough food for them to survive, and now they have to pay a tax on top of that land, which they can't afford, and they have to borrow money. And based on what the biblical commentaries say, the lowest interest rate was around 20%, and the normal expected interest rate is 40%. So if you think your credit card charges were bad, they had it worse. So their debt is going to keep on growing and they had no way to repay. So we see a people who are stuck in financial bondage because of their circumstances. And then we come to verse 5 and we see this terrible consequence of their financial plight. They lament that their sons and daughters are forced to be sold as slaves for the sake of survival. And the field and vineyards, that was once theirs, their inheritance, that they've come back from exile through this miraculous work that God has done to reclaim, is now not even theirs. Because they had to put these things up as collateral to take on debts that they can never pay back. So though they had the land originally, they have received that inheritance, now they are reduced to become landless farmers on their own land. So I want you to see that the first section of this passage shows us a really, really bleak and hopeless situation. They have no escape. Then let us continue to the next section to see what Nehemiah as the leader of the people has to say when he hears this complaint. Have a look at verse 6 to 9. Now Nehemiah was very angry when he heard about the situation of the people of Israel. And we want to see that one contributing factor to the difficulty that the people are having is the fact that all the men are involved in building the wall. So they're not fully 
spending time in their fields, and they had to go all the way from their homes to where the wall is being built, which is very far. So they can't kind of like just hop in for like half an hour, do the wall, and then go back to jaga the plants, right? So the job falls on the wife and children. And the children are being sold to slavery. So here are the people of Israel who has sacrificially come forward to work on the wall, being united with one another, inspired by the words and deeds of Nehemiah. And in serving God, they have become impoverished and now they are suffering. So we see in verse 6, as the person who have led this charge to renew the people, Nehemiah hears the complaint and he takes responsibility. In verse 7, he brought accusations against the nobles and the officials. And this makes it clear that the leadership of Israel has failed the people. But we see that the failure is not that they didn't support, they didn't advise, they didn't guide well. They were actually part of the problem. You see, the ones exacting these high interest rates were the people themselves. You see, all these people who are crying out, they didn't borrow money from merchants outside of Israel. They borrowed money from their own people. And now that they were not able to pay, their own people have acted to possess the lands and the vineyards which they had used as collateral. Their own people have led them to become dispossessed and disenfranchised, even in their own nation, the promised land. So, Nehemiah organized a gathering. He called all of them to come, especially the nobles, in order to bring up this issue. And we see in verse 8, as the leaders were gathered, Nehemiah brings this accusation towards them. We, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. You see the irony here? The Jewish people were a people that were once redeemed from slavery, from God himself. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He has brought these people out of exile in Babylon to freedom in their homeland. Yet then we come to the promised land and we see that the people had been busy selling back everyone into slavery. And so the implication is they have forgotten the grace that God has granted them as he has led them out of the exile to bring them back here. They have been more concerned about their financial gains that they did not see any problem in selling their own brethren into slavery. This is why I think this passage is put in here. At this strange place between these two narratives that talks about the building of the wall. You see, the whole point of building up the wall is for the safety, the security of the Jewish people so that God can establish his people once more. And more than that, we want to see that the whole point of the wall is to show that Israel is set apart from the rest of the world. Israel was meant to be special. It was meant to be God's people gathered to be a light to the nation. They are to show to the world, this is what it looks like to follow our God, Yahweh, that righteous God. They are the advertisement to the world of God's goodness. And so this is why God has given them this land, this nation. This is why God is allowing them to build this wall to separate them. This is the reason God has given them the, the commandments, the ceremonial laws. It's all to keep them separate, to keep them holy. And yet what do we see here in this Israel that has come out of the exile that calls itself God's people? Yes, they are building a wall. But what you see inside is no different than what you see outside. Inside, we see God's people, just like the rest of the world, driven by greed. And out of that, they began to sell their own brothers and sisters into slavery. So how is Israel any different than the rest of the nation that deserves God's judgment? 
What is the point of God bringing them back from exile, setting them up in the promised land, when they're no different than those who do not know God? Can you see that this chapter reveals to us how utterly useless to God's purpose the people have become? And that's why this passage is put in the center between the two narratives of building the wall. It's a warning. Because God is not just about building up the architecture of Israel. God is not just about restoring the temple and the wall and the nation. God is also redeeming. He's building up a people. And the people of Israel are an important part of the restoration. Can you see how stupid it is to focus and say, build up all these nice buildings, but you don't care if the people inside are starving. So that's why, because of the focus on the people, that when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, it always keeps on focusing on how the people respond. It's trying to show you the heart of the people. As they are now, they have revealed that they have failed to be repentant. They don't look like restored people who have come out of the exile. Now remember in Nehemiah chapter 1, the prayer that Nehemiah prays? In that prayer, the prayer touches on God's faithfulness to restore the people if they repent and obey Him. And here is clear proof they have not obeyed, they have not changed. They are headed away from God and this is proven by how they treat their brothers and sisters. Because they chose to deal with them as they would with anyone who borrows money from them. And in doing this to their own people, without love, without mercy, they show proof that they are a failed people. God is now within his right to crush them, to send them into exile, just like he did with their ancestors. So how do they respond when they realize, oh no, we failed? We come to verse 9 to 13, and we see Nehemiah talking to them and their response. Now in Nehemiah 9, sorry, in Nehemiah verse 9, he sets them straight and he declares that what they are doing is wrong. And he reminds them, that the only reason they stand is because it is God who protects them. It is God who protects them from the thorns, from the wickedness of all the nations of the enemies. And they are not secure now because of the strength of their arms. And they should know this. They didn't even have the wall to give them a false sense of security. Yet they have not considered how God sees their action. They acted just like the world does, and they have not feared God. They acted in the moment and saw only profit. Their life was focused on me, not God. So consider for a moment the status that these people have in this newly reformed nation. Originally, we read that they were all united and they were able to withstand the political attacks of their enemies. They were united that they were able to build the wall. They carried weapons to protect one another. They took care of one another. Like, Let's get this done. And they've been successful so far. No enemy could budge them. No one could stop them. Now think about it. If the people of Israel makes this great outcry in verse 1, that they're barely able to live with the food that they have, what do you think is happening to the building up of the wall? We don't see it described here. But do you think the men are happily working on the wall, whistling a tune, while their family is starving and they have to sell their children to slavery? Can you imagine the conversation? Good morning, dear. I see we have no food for breakfast today. You know what? Let's sell little Josh into slavery. That'll settle us for a few weeks. And meanwhile, I'm sure we can make do with the money that we get from him. So I leave the farm to you, you settle it, and me and the other guys, we are going to go build a wall. Praise be to God. <laughs> Obviously not what is happening, right? 
there is disunity within the people. Those men who are faithfully serving God, building the wall, they would be anxious to go back to their farm. Because if I go back, maybe I can make the farm yield just a little bit more. Then my children don't need to go to bed hungry. And so the work on the wall becomes something that no longer unites them. It becomes a burden. Can you imagine that? Their brothers have made it in such a way that serving the Lord is a burden. It's a hateful thing for them now. And the work of the wall no longer unite them. And you can't blame that. You can't call them, oh, these guys are ungodly. Because it's a choice between serving the God to build the wall or starve and sell your children to slavery. Not an easy choice to make. So we see that the unity of the people that has once withstood the enemies, the unity that brought them to work on the wall, it was not threatened by enemies from outside. This unity was utterly destroyed from the inside. Simply because the people desire for riches and they didn't care, they didn't love one another. So Nehemiah called them to once again fear God, walk in the path of righteousness. They need to repent if they're going to be God's chosen people in God's chosen place, under God's rule. So we come to verse 10. And we see Nehemiah declaring that he and the others have been lending people money and grain. And they've been doing it for interest. And then he calls on all of them to abandon the extracting of interest. Now I want you to see that this is actually quite, quite big. Right? Imagine if tonight you went back, you switch on the TV and the Prime Minister of Malaysia comes up. He makes an announcement, ah, you know, economy is really tough. Things are getting very hard. There's only so much we can do with all this Bantuan Madani thing. So I call on every bank to stop all the interest. Just cancel all the interest. Right? Not put a freeze, cancel it. Right? Every bank loan, car loan, house loan, how do you think the economic institution will respond? Not very great, right? But that's what Nehemiah is calling for. You see, we just read it as, oh, okay, lah, cut out the text. But that's a huge thing because this is what keeps the economy moving. In the scriptures, God has clearly outlined how the people should behave when they lend money to their own people. Exodus 22:25 declares, If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not extract interest from him. In fact, Ezekiel 18:13, the prophet condemns. Lend at interest and take profit? Shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all this. Look at the word that's used. Abomination. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Leviticus 25, 36 teaches, Take no interest from him or profit, but fear your God, that your brother may live beside you. So the principle throughout scripture is actually very clear. They're not to be a people who profit from the suffering and difficulties of their own people. Now, God is not against profit-taking. God is not saying you can never levy interest. But what God is interested in, that those who borrow money, they do it with compassion, they care for the welfare of those who are burdened, and these things should be higher up than the desire for profit. And the key thing that they need to think about when they're thinking, how do I lend money to my brother? Is the goal is so that the brothers can live together in peace and harmony, in shalom. So you don't lend money because you want to make profit from your brother. You lend money so that they can survive, so they can stay with you, so they can have peace. And this is the very thing they have failed to do. So Nehemiah rightly 
calls on them to take this drastic action, cancel out the interest, stop all of this. Be like how God expects you to be. But more than that, in verse 11, Nehemiah calls on them to restore their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, their house, their money, and all the things that have been taken from the people. Now I want you to see, if you thought the first one was kind of big, this is even bigger. Imagine the day after you switch on the TV, Prime Minister comes up again. You know guys, we look at the situation, just stopping the interest not enough. I'm going to call on the banks now to cancel out every loan for every car, every house. Just write it off, guys. <laughs> right? You can imagine at that point, all those bank executives will be bending down to pick up a rock. <laughs> it's a shocking move. It's huge. It's a big consequences. At one point, you need to imagine, imagine that this Nehemiah must be like really, really brave. But he dares to do this because he knows what is God's will and he knows he's talking to God's people. This was the right thing to ask. Even though it seems so, so difficult to ask this. And of course, we expect in the text for the people to revolt, to reject Nehemiah, to cast him out. Yet we come to verse 12, and surprisingly, we see the people agreeing to do this. That's interesting, isn't it? The promise to restore this, sorry, they promise to restore all these things, and they say they require nothing of them. This is a great response when their sin is pointed out. It shows us that they repented, and they sought to bring restoration. And friends, at this point, um, it's helpful to see that's a great reminder for us too, right? In case there are things that we have done in terms of love for brothers and sisters that we might need to repent from. They were willing to take on such a huge cost. And we will see throughout Nehemiah, this bunch of return exiles, they will fail again and again. And I'm sure when we first read this passage, oh, yo, this guy's terrible. Ah. We look down on them. Right? But the key thing to remember is that actually when God calls them to be accountable, they respond. So in that sense, it's a commentary in the book of Nehemiah, we can see that there is a change of heart in the return exile. And we will, of course, see more of this as the narrative unfolds. And I won't spoil it for you. Just keep on reading Nehemiah. And as you do, look at what's happening with the people. And so we should learn from this. We should be willing to turn away from what the, the things that we like when we're confronted with God's word, even if it is at a great cost to us. So let us model after these people. Seek to always respond to God's word. Seek to always serve him rightly. Now, in declaring these things, Nehemiah wanted them to see. This is really serious, guys. This declaration is meant to be a binding promise from them to the people who are suffering. So he calls on the priests. Make them swear. Your promise huh, that you'll do. Huh? And you can see the implication, right? The priest is the one who mediates between God and the people. And they're making a promise to him. And to remind them of the severity, he takes his garment and he shakes it out. And he's symbolically trying to show, right, that as he shakes it out, all the dust, I don't know what crumbs he has on it, all falls off. It's a warning that God will shake off any man who's not going to keep this promise. Well, you guys say already, I better do. Basically, that's what he's saying. Then we come to the last part of this passage, and we see Nehemiah modeling to the leaders how he himself acted towards the people. We see in verse 14 and 15 that in the 12 years that Nehemiah was governor, he did not use the food allowance of the governor for food. Now this allowance was quite expensive, 40 shekels of silver, which is taken from the people as a tax. And this tax is meant to allow the governor to organize, to have this really big feast, and it's meant to be a political tool 
so that the governor can have table relationships with people who are important for the governance, leaders, people that you know kind of grease the grease the the gears that's turning, right? So it's expected for the governor to have this piece to build up relationship. And the former governors did this. They took the money. In fact, not only did they take, even the servants were very proud. They're like, oh, you know, come pay pay, right? We get to eat all the good food. But then we see Nehemiah, he did not choose to do this. And he gives us the reason, because he feared God. See, I want you to see, that this was actually his right. No one can fault him for demanding this. Because he's expected to do the work, and he's expected to receive payment. And we see the Apostle Paul doing the same thing as well, right? It was his right to receive from the Corinthians. But he decided, like, no, no, I won't take money from you. I will build tents. So similar to that, he did not want to burden the people. So he willingly gave up his right for their well-being. And he didn't give up his right and then kind of, okay, then no need lah he still continued to do what he saw as his responsibility and he did it with his own funds. And we see in verse 16, the Nehemiah said, while he persevered on building the wall, he didn't take advantage of this to acquire lands. And part of the reason why you have all this makan makan is, you know, you're friend with the guy who, who helps out with the selling of lands or setting up of things. So you get the better deal, lah, right? And he's saying he never took advantage. So yes, he had the table fellowship, but it's not for his business. It's not for his personal enrichment. It was for the sake of drawing the people together. It's for the sake of the government. His focus was on what God wanted him to do. So we see that Nehemiah really was a servant of the people. He was not greedy. He did not seek to enrich himself beyond what God has generously provided him. Right? Now, some of you might think, oh, yeah, cup bearer, he's like, uh, you know, you go to a restaurant, the guy who brings the drinks for you, and that's not it. Lah. A cup bearer is a very high position. He's like a menteri, lah, like he's a minister, right? So, he's not poor. God has blessed him. Now that he's in this situation, he's willing to give up his wealth for the sake of God's kingdom. It's amazing. And we see in verse 17, it wasn't like some cheap, you know, you just come in, you have some, you know, few fried chicken, one fried rice. No, he fed around 150 men. And we see that he called in Jews and officials, and he even called those from other nations who have come to Israel. And the implication is, these are people who come to join in with the Israelites. We want to become with you. So it's a picture here of a fellowship meal. It's a blessing to both the Israelites who are Jews and those foreigners who have come in to become Israelites, the Gentiles in that sense. And all of them, Jews and Gentiles, invited to his table as he shared his blessing with them in fellowship and generosity. And verse 18 shows you he really was generous. Huh? He described the feast with ox, six choices of sheep, bird and wine as well. All of this coming out of his pocket. And he did not demand for the allowance as governor, despite it being his right. So the point we want to see here is that he saw the situation of the people. He didn't want to burden them and he responded in love and mercy. And yet he still did his duty. So the passage then closes with an appeal to God to remember him for what he has done for his people. And what he has done is show his faithfulness to God. And that faithfulness comes as an outpouring of gratitude to what God has done. So at this point, some of us may be tempted, wow, this Nehemiah, after scolding the people, now he's bragging, oh, I did all these things, right? And actually, I want you to see, right, that he starts this narrative with a moreover. Right? He's trying to explain something more. And so he's saying this in order to encourage the people of Israel to think of how they relate to the brothers and sisters, right? So if earlier he's told them, look, borrow, take interest, but if the people are suffering, cancel it lah, okay? But here he's showing, 
more than that, be willing to sacrifice for the betterment of the people, even if it is your right. You see, the taking of money from poor, the law forbids it. You shouldn't do it, don't do it. But here it's saying, even if you're allowed to do it, if, you, if it's not good for God's people, actually better don't do it. Lah. Sacrifice. You see, he's, he's using this narrative to point them to the higher truth of what God means when he wants his people to love each other. So, we see that this whole passage is one big point. It's talking to us about how the people are supposed to relate to the brothers and sisters. It's about love. It's about building up God's people. It's about being sacrificial. And we also see that Nehemiah did not just talk the talk, he walked the walk in sharing this. And so we come to the end of the passage and we have to ask ourselves, right, how does this apply to us? Now the first thing, and I hope this was clear, we want to see that God wants his people to be different than the world around them. The people of God are to look different because they are God's people. So while you don't have a wall here that separates you from the rest of the world, while you don't live within the compound of St. Mary's Cathedral, the idea is if someone from outside looks within, they need to see something that's different about God's people. If there's selfishness out there in the world and they come here and they see the same thing here, you see people demanding, hey, this is my right. How dare this person do this? Then we have failed. So people should look at the congregation and say, wow, these people are so different. Is this what it means to follow their Lord Jesus? So consider our situation, right? We are really eager to rebuild the cathedral. We are giving funds to the fixing of the, the roof and all the things that's going on over there. And that's wonderful. We see God's people coming together. right? We see that unity. We see that sacrifice. At the same time, you also need to ask, right? Is that unity reflected in how we relate to each other? Because friends, if you are quick to whip out your checkbook to help out with this, to help out with whatever that the building needs, but you do not show love, you are just a clanging gong without love. So we do need to ask, as a congregation, are we gracious and merciful towards each other? Are we kind, generous to each other? Do we look for the needs that people have and see how can we help them? How do we care for those who are not so well off? If people need our help, what is our attitude towards them? Now, I'm glad that here at St. Mary's, we do have a social concerns ministry. And I know that there are many people who benefit from this ministry. And I do know that there are some of you who intentionally go above and beyond, beyond your giving to serve in social concerns. And at this point, I just want to plug in, right? Uh, do consider supporting the work that they're doing. And they need more volunteers. They need people who have the heart to love people, who can follow up with people who need help, who can assess the situation so that as a church, we can spend our resources wisely. Right? Now, one way to overreact to Nehemiah 5 is everyone who seems to have a problem, you, ah, give you some money, give you some money. It's probably not the most helpful way to do it, right? So do consider supporting the Social Concerns Ministry. Uh, we're especially looking for someone to, to take up responsibilities. Do think of the people with, among here who have financial difficulties and think about how you can be helping them. And uh, I'm not condemning you guys here, right? I know that there are some here who have very kindly offered financial help. I know some have gone out of their way to help someone find jobs when they don't have it. And I know that in general, many of you have shown the love of God to people. 
So I'll be honest, in this, when I was preparing the passage, I didn't feel a pressing need to come and rebuke or scold the congregation. John taught us in his gospel, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I have to say, many of you are doing a good job of showing that love. So to those who are doing that, well done. Continue to love God's people in the various ways that you do. Though I do suspect there would still be some of us who may not have gotten around to think about this, may have been so caught up in our daily concerns, our finances, our worries, and we may not have actually looked around us to see how can we be loving others. And to those, I do encourage you, do be thinking about how you can act in such a way towards the people of God <coughs> that you'll be able to show the rest of the world how God's people can behave towards each other. So be careful. Don't get too lost in thinking of your business or finances. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but do be looking to, to the community. So God saved you to be his people and he expects each and every one of us to be his people. We have to love each other. We have to uphold each other. So I encourage you to consider how can you be kind? How can you be generous to those who are less fortunate? Perhaps you can consider buy them a meal, help them out with their small necessities, get them some groceries, Thank you so much. Right? Or even just calling them to pray for them. And do all of this, not because you want them to praise you, but like Nehemiah did, do it because you fear God. Do it because you seek to live your life according to what God says is good and right even if it costs you. There may still be some who are worldly towards our brothers and sisters. There might be those who are cold, and you know this person is you know, financially not good, and they're kind of thinking, uh, should I take community meal? I can't put anything. And then they see, and I kind of walk away, like they're expecting me to put in money for them. Uh, right? And if that is you, do consider what you're doing because God knows what you're doing. Another point to note, right? Even as we see Nehemiah providing this fellowship meal, drawing people in with his love and generosity, I just want to point forward to the picture that God shows, his, uh, how God shows his great love and generosity, right? God promises us a place in the wedding supper of the Lamb. And in that we see that Jesus is the one who's truly most generous towards us. He calls us to his table where he forgives sins. He nourishes us spiritually. And our union with him is pictured in scripture as this great fellowship meal, kind of mirroring the meals that we see in the Bible, right? The fellowship meals. And Jesus... He calls those who are Jews, who are Gentiles, to his table. And in his sacrificial service towards us, he gave up more than 40 shekels of silver so that he can love us. So as we look to Jesus, we see God's plan for his people realize. Through Jesus, we see someone who's to a greater leader than Nehemiah was. And through Jesus, we see the same message brought out, the call to love our neighbors, to honor our brothers and sisters so that we can live in peace together. And the implication of that is when we are faced with this burden of caring for each other, when you see the cost that's attached to it, I cannot buy a new Tesla because I have to support so many people. 
Well, when it feels hard, look to Jesus and remember what we should do. And even as we look to Jesus, as we serve the people in the church, as we look at this weekly Christian gathering that we have, we know that we should look forward to more than just the meals that we provide for each other. All right, that little meal that we have there, some people generously bring in sandwiches, uh, little snacks. That's amazing. Our community meals, we gather together for lunch fellowship, eager to encourage, to talk with each other. Those are really good things, right? Uh, and not forgetting your post-service makan, wherever you guys go to hang out together. It's, that's really good. But let's go beyond that makan. Let's go beyond that fellowship and look to that fellowship in the marriage supper, that ultimate gathering where we will know true fellowship with God. And if, if this gathering is so important, right? Like, oh, we encourage each other, come to church, guys. I haven't seen you in church for a while. Come, come, make sure that you're there. Then actually, that heavenly gathering is even more important, right? And so we do want to think about how can we encourage and strengthen people that they don't miss out on that heavenly gathering. Don't act in such a way that people, because of our coldness, leave the church, leave the fellowship, and ignore God. Let us be the light that draws people to God. And we do this as we encourage, as we build up, as we love God's people, so that every one of us then can join in that heavenly feast at our Lord Jesus' feet. Let us learn to put our trust in God's chosen King, Jesus, the one who is greater than Nehemiah, who's able to forge this unity that's greater than what you saw in the text, the one who's able to build up more than the wall, he builds up the kingdom of God. And if you see all of this, as we trust him, let us listen to his command that we love one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. And we pray now, Lord, that, that you will help us to continue to think about how we can be loving your people. And help us to change the things that are not good so that we may glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray.